are you doing? This is uh, Wednesday, Wednesday night Bible study, February 17th. We're studying the book of Matthew. I'm Doug Griffin. And um, let's just review where we've been so far. Let's see. Here we go. We are uh, talking about what's called the Olivet Discourse. And that's where Jesus is describing why the temple is about to be thrown down and every stone cast into the sea. We'll get there in a second. And um, <clears throat> the disciples, like, what are you talking about? Um, this is one of the, it's probably the most misunderstood, misquoted um, chapter in the Bible. Because a lot of people think that Jesus is talking about something that's future to us, an event that's about to happen, as opposed to an event that has already happened. It happened in 70 AD. That's when the temple was destroyed. And, the, and everything he says is an explanation of how and when the temple is going to be destroyed. So there's, there's nothing in Matthew chapter 24 that has anything to do with something that has yet to happen. It all happened in 70 AD. And Jesus is explaining why and when. This is the second time the temple has been destroyed. And it's actually destroyed on the very same day, uh, 700 years apart. Uh, so um, this is big news to the disciples because it's taken 46 years to, um, well, it took a long time to rebuild the temple. And then it was attacked uh, one more time. and But it wasn't destroyed. It was just kind of attacked and in, in shoddy repair. And so the Herods uh, took a 46-year period and really gussied it up, like made it incredible, almost as good as in Solomon's day. And it's white and gold and and this it's football fields long and three stories high. Uh, it's this phenomenal wonder of the world. So the disciples are understandably proud of it. So for Jesus to say, it's all about to be, all about to be torn down is shocking to them. But it's just, not only is that happening, Jesus is explaining, but Jerusalem is going to be devastated. And so um, this period was recorded by a an historian named Josephus between 30 AD and 70 AD, between the crucifixion of Christ and when the temple was um, destroyed. And so Jesus is warning about this time period when judgment is going to come. So what he's talking about is really the end of the first coming, not the beginning of the second coming. His first coming is in two parts. He preaches salvation, and then when he's rejected, he has to warn them about judgment. And he brings the judgment personally. He brings the judgment on Israel, on the um, covenant breakers, not the covenant keepers. The covenant keepers went on and all, went all over and did wonderful things. But the covenant breakers, judgment comes on them. And that ends his first coming when he brings judgment in 70 AD. So it's the end of his first coming, but people think it's the beginning of his second coming, and it's not. So we, we want to read through these scriptures very carefully, and we'll, we'll encounter some of the ones that have, have been misinterpreted. But I do uh, want to quote from Josephus again, who was there. Um, um, it, here's a, uh, you, this is Eusebius. He was a Roman in the third century, and then Josephus lived at the same time of Jesus. And um, they're both talking about it. So Eusebius is saying, when defeat seems certain, the zealots of the group decide that it is better to die at their own. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. Let me give you the background for this. Um, so after Jesus is persecuted and dies on the cross, two things happen. His followers um, preach the gospel in Jerusalem, and then persecution comes upon them, and then they start spreading out. 
those who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, they continued to fight the Roman government. They're waiting for the Messiah to show up uh, and get involved in the politics of the day. Jesus kept trying to tell them, I'm not going to get involved in politics. That's not, I have my own kingdom. Uh, render, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. That's not my business. But they're like, no, no, you got it. The taxes are too high. And they have a list of grievances with the Romans. And surely that's what God is concerned about. He's very concerned about how high my taxes are. They're positive of that. And so when Jesus does not confront the Romans, and all he wants to talk about is the kingdom of God and all that spiritual stuff. They, well, you can't be the Messiah. So um, Jesus' followers, they go out and they just preach the gospel. The, those who are still waiting for the Messiah, they're fighting the Romans. And they're mad, and the Romans are not great to them. I'm not saying and that they have every good reason to fight them. That just was not the battle that Jesus was interested in fighting. So... They fight the Romans and fight the Romans and fight the Romans until they just refuse to taxes anymore. We're not going to do it. And they kill some Roman soldiers and that, okay, that does it. That tears it. And so Nero sends Vespasian down, one of his, his top general, and Vespasian's son is Titus. So he sends him down and they begin to attack Judea. So they're coming from Rome all the way to Jerusalem. That's a long walk. And um, they start in the north of Judea, and they're going to slowly go down and then finally attack Rome. I mean, uh, Jerusalem, right? So they start in the north of Judea, and then they're going to slowly attack each city, Galilee, and all the way down that until they get to Jerusalem. And that's going to, you know, then, haha, we'll have conquered those Jews. So uh, when they start in the top and to attack, a group of are fighting them. Like, we can defeat those Romans, but they couldn't. They can't defeat, you know. Because they, they sent, he sent, like, uh, 50,000 Roman soldiers, right? So, um, Eusebius is writing, when defeat seemed certain, the zealots of the group decide that it is better to die at their own hands than to be sold into slavery or to watch their families be mercilessly butchered by the Romans. Thus, they make a pact to kill their own wives and children, and then themselves. Wrong order. Wrong order always. Please shoot yourself first, and then. So they're going to kill their wives and children, then themselves. So Josephus is one of the few survivors, because Josephus said to them, yes, listen, I'll be the last to go, just to make sure that everybody goes. And they bought that. So they all killed their wives and children and then killed themselves. And Josephus said, I'm not feeling that today. So Josephus is one of the survivors. And rather than kill himself, he surrendered to the Romans. He walked out and said, hey, hey they're all dead. You don't even have to fight. I'm good. And uh, the Romans said, instead of killing this man, we're going to make him a historian. You record everything and write everything down. And he did. He wrote every single thing. So we know exactly what was going on all this time. All right. And then Eusebius, uh, who was a Roman uh, a couple centuries later, he, he also wrote about it, but based on Josephus' works. So they, they, they fight, they fight, they fight. They come all the way down to Jerusalem. It says, while the Romans are besieging the city on the outside, the Jews are waging a civil war on the inside. So they surround the city. Vespasian is, is, is there waiting, and this city is incredibly fortified, right? You, it, they really could have withstood them for a long time, except they started fighting one another. So um, it says that at this time, the zealots are not allowing anyone to leave the city, as if anyone wanted to flee to be crucified did come out of the city, the Romans would grab them and crucify them. So the zealots are starving them on the inside, just reminding us what was going on, because they don't want anybody to surrender. No, we're going to fight. So the zealots cut off all the food supplies, and you're either going to fight or die. And so you've got all these weak people who, with no food, ready to fight the Romans. And the Romans are just waiting them out, and they're fighting each other on the inside. Remember, Jesus said, brother will turn against brother and father against son. That's exactly what was going on. Okay. So 
it says the, the zealots are not allowing anyone to leave the city except for burials. So if you know they, you could be buried outside the city. So in a desperate bid to try and salvage something from the impending disaster, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakai has himself put in a casket and taken out to Vespasian. So he fakes his death. He gets in the co coffin and he's carried out to Vespasian, who thinks he's already dead, so there's no reason to, to crucify him, right? And Vespasian, when he gets out of the casket, he at, uh, he tells Vespasian, well, first of all, all the Romans go, ooh, somebody just got out of the casket. Over that, uh, he tells him, Vespasian, you are, you're going to be emperor soon. And Vespasian, how dare you, you know? Uh, and and I, I should kill you for saying that. And that's black, because Nero's the emperor. Well, a, a letter shows up saying Nero has just committed suicide and they want, they have decided that at least the Romans had decided that Vespasian should be emperor. There were three other people who also wanted to be emperor at the same time, Galba and Otho and, 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 and other. So there's a big fight that begins to take place over who's going to take Nero's place. And three other emperors over like a six month period were each became emperor, but finally Vespasian becomes emperor. But he's very impressed, right, when he gets this letter saying, we want you to be emperor, that this rabbi had just come out and told him, you're going to be emperor someday. So he says, you can have whatever you want. You know, just what, just tell me what you want. And what he asks for is the Torah. He says, there's a city where there are scholars who are working on the Torah. And if, I, if you could let me go to that city and we could save that city and, pres and preserve it, then would be I wish. So he lets him go to the city and and that's how we that's why the Jews still have the Torah to this day, because shortly thereafter, Argentitus uh, goes into the city and begins to besiege it, and they would have and they burned the whole city down. And if he hadn't asked for that, if he hadn't escaped in the casket and allowed those uh, Jewish scholars to live and escape to a, a different city, then there'd be nothing left of the Judaism would have been uh, wiped out. So here's Josephus describing the siege of because Titus is left, and Titus waits them out. Titus Titus um, allows all these Jews to come from all over the world and to celebrate Passover. That is the big deal. We got to go and celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. So just go on, go on in. We won't even bother you. So he lets them all in. So now there's like a million Jews from all over the world celebrating Passover. Then he attacked. Uh, but he, he let them celebrate Passover. He didn't. He, he said, oh yeah, you can celebrate Passover and then I'm going to kill you. He didn't tell them that part. So while the holy house, this is Josephus, the temple was on fire. So he, this, um, Titus goes in. Uh, it takes several months fighting them off, but he begins his siege and and finally makes it to the temple, sets it on fire. So while the holy house, the temple was on fire, everything was plundered that came to hand. And 10,000 of those that were caught were slain, nor were there, was there a commission, oh, I'm sorry, commiseration of any age. But children and old men and priests were all slain in the same manner. The flame was also carried a long way and made an echo together with the groans of those who were slain. One would have thought the whole city would have been on fire, nor can anyone imagine anything greater or more terrible than the noise, the sound of their crying and the screaming and the fire. And so this is just Josephus, again, he'd written down, uh, he's describing it as it's happening. So that's why we know everything that went on. Okay, so um, Jesus predicted all of this. This is what he's talking about in Matthew chapter 24. This is not what people say in Matthew 24, which is about some future or, or coming of Jesus. Um, and there are some difficult verses, that, and I can see why people have said, well, a, it looks like it's talking about the future, but I'll explain. So I'm just going to again remind you that Jesus has said uh, there's not one stone of this temple that will be left standing. He's on the Mount of Olives, right? And um, the, they ask him three questions. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and at the end of the age? This word coming is not the normal um, word 
in th this this word when it's time is your coming is the word that it's per perusia which is um what you would use to describe caesar when, it, when he was showing up at the court to to ready to you know be royal and everything they want to know when when will you come in as king and what and and what's going to be the sign of the end of the age now some translations translate this end of the world but it doesn't mean the earth the end of the cosmos the end of the earth it just it literally means the age uh and we use this world world a lot of times but we never mean the earth you know um and and that's how they meant it what the end of the age the disciples had a strong understanding that history was divided in half. There was the old covenant, and then there was the this new covenant that was coming because it had been it predicted in Jeremiah 31, 31. It says, Behold, the days are when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So they're, they're, they're aware that there's the age of the old covenant is coming to an end and there's going to be the age of the new covenant, this new covenant that will be written in their minds and their hearts. So when they say, what's the signs of the end of this age? Like, when is that going to end? When? when we're no longer bound by the law of Moses, but instead it'll be written on our hearts. In Ezekiel uh, 36, verse 25 and 26, it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. And that's the whole secret is that we're only able to do these things if Christ is in us. It's Christ that allows us, that gives us the energy, the ability to do these things. It's been uh, just too much time trying to get the world to stop sinning. You need to stop doing that and stop those abortions and stop this and stuff. And they can't without Jesus. They can't. You can make... We, we have made laws. I mean, so you make all the laws you want. Like, there's a law like, uh, thou shalt not murder. That hasn't stopped people from murdering. Uh, Thievery is a, against the law. That doesn't stop people from doing. Only Jesus can stop that. And we we can so we can spend a lot of time. We can make a lot of laws. That's not going to stop people. But we can spend the majority of our time giving them Jesus. And when Jesus is in you, He will stop you. He will change our hearts. And that's what that's what the disciples, the followers of Jesus, went out doing. And while the, the ones, the covenant breakers who didn't believe Jesus was Messiah, they spent all their time trying to change the Roman laws. And, and where Paul ended up in Rome and ended up in Roman prison, even though he was trying to avoid it, Paul ends up in a Roman prison. He starts witnessing to the soldiers. And, it, and he says that I, he witnessed to those in the household of Caesar, some servants who worked for Caesar uh, and the emperor. And slowly... The, the Christianity spread and it finally got up to the emperor and he got saved. And, and that's how things were changed. That's how things change. You have to change hearts. So you can, we can spend our, our, our time just arguing and you, I, I'm so mad, but, uh, or you can change someone's heart and let Jesus do the work, right? So uh, skipping, we left off last week. Matthew chapter 24, verse 27 says, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so, uh, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. This is something that we think is going to happen. That we're going to see Jesus flash across the sky. But this is talking about the suddenness of it the swiftness of it, because he, uh, earlier he'd said, when they say, ooh, the Messiah is there, or the Christ is there, don't believe that. I'm not going to be in a desert. I'm gonna, it's going to be suddenly when you see me come back. Uh, and again, he's talking about the end of his first coming. Um, it'll be as just as the lightning is going to be quick, because lightning flashes, boom, right? So you won't be able to predict it. He's saying there's no use sitting around waiting for it, but just know it will be sudden. 
uh, and I read you Malachi chapter three, uh, verse one and two, where it says, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? So yeah, he's coming, but it's going to be sudden. And when he comes, you're not going to like it if you're a covenant breaker, if you're on the wrong side. It's like the principal suddenly showing up in your room or something like, uh-oh, that, you know, that's not good. So, and, and again, when someone's suddenly at your door, if the head of the FBI is suddenly at your door, that's never a good thing. And Jesus says, okay, I'm coming back and you, you won't be happy. It'll be, it'll be sudden. You should have listened to me while I was here because when I come back, so um, so as the lightning flashes from the east, it'll be sudden, right? So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. And we want to, again, attack this phrase, Son of Man. The, the phrase Son of Man uh, first in the Bible appeared in Ezekiel, right? God called him Son of Man. Started right in the first chapter. He says, Son of Man. Uh, but I'm going to start in Ezekiel chapter 2. But all through the first chapter, he calls him Son of Man. And then Ezekiel chapter 2 uh, starting with the second verse, it says, Then the Spirit entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet. And I heard him who spoke to me. And he said to me, Son of man. And he calls him this like 87 times in the book of Ezekiel. Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day, for they are impudent and stubborn children. And I Thus saith the Lord thy God. So, son of man, to Ezekiel, God calls him that because that, that means you, I'm, you're human, but I'm using you as an instrument to give a warning to the house of Israel. Jesus started to call himself the son of man because that's his mission. Ezekiel was a type of Jesus in that, and that was like a preview. It was like a dress rehearsal. So you know how Ezekiel came and showed up? The first time the temple was destroyed, and Ezekiel's the one that let everybody in on it. Hey, guess what? This temple's going to be destroyed, and you better believe me. Jesus said, "I'm the Son of Man too, because I'm coming you the second time to tell you that." The in Ezekiel chapter three, verse seventeen and nineteen, it says, "Son of Man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me." When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. So God's saying, if I, if I give you a warning for somebody, and we don't like, but some people, that's their ministry. Hey, you need to watch out. You know, that's going to lead to something bad, and we need to listen. Because that bad thing is going to happen. And if they don't say it, God's saying, it's still going to happen. <laughs> I'm not going to go, oh, man, you never told them, so I guess I can't do it. God's saying, oh, no, they'll still die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand because you did not warn them. You didn't, you didn't warn them. So he's saying, son of man, when I give you a word of warning, you have to give it. It doesn't matter whose feelings it hurts. Um, in, in verse... Uh, 19 of Ezekiel chapter 3, it says, Yet, if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. That's on him. And so Jesus spent a good deal of his ministry warning people of this destruction. He was constantly warning people, walking around healing. And, and praying for the sick because he says, the spirit of God is upon me. He's anointed me to heal the brokenhearted. And he, he walked around and changing lives. But every time he ran into a Pharisee, uh, he, spent, uh, he warned them and warned them and warned them of the coming destruction. This is, and God has actually been warning them about this for about 700 years since the first temple was destroyed. So this isn't something that God uh, just sprung on them. Like, well, I don't, don't know why I tell me nothing. That's not this. What this is not that sort of situation. They've been warned for seven hundred years. After the first temple was destroyed, Daniel got that warning and saying, "Okay, uh, <laughs> I'm going to do it again unless they change." And so Jesus said, "I'm here to tell you that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's about to happen." So, uh, in fact, in Matthew 23, 
he just, this is the last thing he said in the temple to the Pharisees before he left to go to the Mount of Olives and talk to, he says, uh, Matthew 23, verse 34 says, therefore, indeed, I sent you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. So I, I'm going to send all these people to you. Jesus is saying, I'm going to send them to you. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, which is exactly what happened to the followers of Jesus, the ones, the covenant keepers. They went out warning in droves, warning people and, and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, but they wouldn't listen. So he says, um, some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah. So I'm sending you people and all you're going to do is not listen. I know how you are. And so the consequences of all of that has been building up, building up, building up. That's why I have a joke with my friends where we like to say, uh, judged instantly when something happens, because it's always better to be judged instantly. If that judgment waits, like I love, yeah, judge me instantly, Lord, don't let it, because it builds up like a snowball coming down a hill. It just builds up, builds up, builds up. You think you're getting away with something. <laughs> God hasn't gotten me yet. I'm getting away with something. But all it is is the, is the punishment and the judgment is getting bigger and bigger because he's giving us time to repent like a snowball coming down the hill. That avalanche is getting bigger and bigger. He's, giving, he's waiting so that we can repent. But we use that time, unfortunately, sometimes to get, well, I wasn't caught, so I guess I'll do it again. And, and that's, you know, we do it if we're speeding, if there's things that we do, and if we don't get caught immediately, we don't say, wow, Lord, that was, you're so merciful. Thank you. You know, I could have gotten killed, but uh, we think, ah, I got away with something. I think I'll do it again. Right, right. So just because it's not instant, we think it's not coming, but it's always coming. And so he's warning them for hundreds of years. So he says, now on you will all the righteous blood shed. Uh, from from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. All of that is coming on you. Don't forget a, a Cain, who slew Abel, didn't get instant punishment. God gave him space to repent, right? And, but he's saying, I, I have turned my back on that enough. And if I'm sending you people who are telling, I've sent my son, right? And in that parable, you know, he sends the, these different servants to the vineyard and say, Hey, you guys need to change, you need to change. And they kill every single one. And he said, Well, surely they won't. And don't call me Shirley. Surely they won't kill my son. But he sends the son and they kill him too. And Jesus asked the Pharisees, What should he do? What should the owner of the vineyard do? He says, Well, you should kick them out. He says, Yeah, that's what's about to happen. This whole place is about to be leveled. So on you, it's all going to fall. Because whom you murdered between the temple and the altar, because you're this, you're the sons of those. You're, but it's even worse. You're even more guilty, because they were sent prophets. But I'm the actual Messiah here, whom you're about to murder, and so all of it's going to fall on you. So assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Okay. So he says that. That's the last thing he says to them. He warns them. They just don't listen. Then he goes out to the Mount of Olives, and now he's explaining to the disciples when these things are going to occur. So, um, in Matthew chapter 27, uh, he again, and this is why it doesn't only fall on the priests. He, he warns the people. And um, when, when he's standing in judgment, and, and they've decided already that they're going to ask for Barabbas instead of asking for Jesus, the people have, you know, yeah, yeah we, that Jesus, you know, he, yeah, he went around healing the sick and casting devils out of people, but what has he done for me lately? Mm. Kill him, right? So Pilate's questioned Jesus to see, why, why are they trying to kill you? And of course, he can find nothing. And in Matthew 27, verse 24, it says, when Pilate saw prevail at all like he couldn't convince the people <laughs> in fact he says but this is your king and they said we have no king but caesar so okay so you're making caesar your king instead of god all right so when he saw that he couldn't prevail at all but rather that a tumult was rising 
He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Uh -oh. Okay. So this is, it's amazing, right? Because Jesus has done every sign. He, he was born at the time that the prophets predicted. He, they saw him raise people from the dead. I mean, what else could he do? He's done everything he could do. And they still said, no, we want crucify him because we don't want to hear what he's got to say. And so, you know, his blood be on us and on our children. As Jesus was taking the cross uh, up the hill later on, uh, it says that there were people weeping, following him. And, and these were the trained weepers. You could hire them and they'd come and make sure there was plenty of weeping whenever your child, if somebody died, you know, they were good at it. So they're following him and weeping. And in verse uh, Luke 23, 28, it says, Jesus turned to them and said, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. Because you just said, you know, you've, you've wished this on you and that's what's going to happen. In fact, Luke 21, 20, he says, these are the days of vengeance that all the things which are written may be fulfilled. So he's done everything he could do. It's, we're just not as aware of it because we love to point to all the wonderful things and he healed this person and he healed that person, and which he did. And we kind of skip over all the parts. But half of what Jesus did was warn people of what was to come. And they skipped over those parts too. They're just like, we don't, we don't like hearing bad stuff. La, 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 I want to hear it. Okay, but it's still coming whether you want to hear it or not. So Matthew chapter 10, verse 26. Jesus explaining to them as lightning. Oh, I actually, I backed up. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out there. Look, he's in the inner, inner rooms. Don't believe it. Because if you're looking for the, the, for the Messiah, he's not going to be in the desert, he's not going to be in the mountains. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be boom, just like that. And he will come to administer justice, just like Ezekiel came and warned, and then it happened. I'm that same Son of Man, that like, just like Ezekiel. Verse 28, forever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. That's you'll, you'll know where to find me because there'll be vultures hovering over all the death that will have happened. So, and how could he be, what else can he say? I mean, oh my goodness. He's just telling people this destruction is coming, but either you believe or you don't, that's on you. All people can do, all you can do is be warned. Don't put your hand on that stove, it's hot. Don't touch that, it's hot. Be careful to walk on that glass. Uh, you, and then people have to decide if they're going to listen or not. And those who listen are saved and those who don't really can't complain because they were warned. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. So this is when people say everything you're saying, but that doesn't sound, that, that sounds like the end of the world. That sounds like the end of the world, not the end of the first coming not just judgment only on Jerusalem. That sounds like when people say, and see, this is, this is when the world's going to end seven years from now or a hundred, however they say. He's still talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and he's using poetic language. And he's using language from the Old Testament. What happened in the 70s when these incredible books came out, like 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 88. Mm -hmm. And then, now first he wrote 86 reasons why he's coming back in 86. And then, when, and then in, when that didn't happen, he wrote a book called 88 reasons why he's coming back in 88. And no repentance. They just keep moving the goalposts. They don't ever say, maybe we're wrong on this thing. Maybe Jesus isn't coming back. Maybe the sign wasn't when Israel becomes a nation. They just tell you, okay, well, now it's going to be 2007. Uh, and now it's good. So they just keep moving it. It'd be any I'm telling you, any time now, and they just keep saying, because they're misreading it. These are people who, who did not read the Old Testament, because the Old Testament, I guess, can be feel boring to some people. I think it's amazing uh, and has like the best stories ever written in it. 
And so I feast on the Old Testament. And then when I read through the New Testament, I realize, oh, he's just quoting the Old Testament. Oh, that's just quoting the Old Testament. That's because that's all. There was no t New Testament when Jesus was preaching. Everyone knew the Old Testament and he would quote it to fulfillment of this scripture, this is fulfillment of that scripture. So when he says immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. He's quoting um, every single time God brought destruction on a nation. He would use that same language. God would say, like in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 1 and then 9 through 10, he says, this is the burden against Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. So Isaiah saw this. He says, behold, verse 9, the day the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light, and the sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. So that's how he describes it, because God's giving them a picture of, of what's going to happen. But it's not a literal picture. It's a poetic picture. He's using judgment language. The stars will not shine and the moon. Because when that happens, whenever there was a, if uh, there was an eclipse or something like that, everyone would get scared. Oh, my God, it's dark. And it was all, it's a scary time for them. And God's saying, yes, it's going to be a scary time. I'm coming in, in judgment. And yes. He brought down Babylon. Isaiah predicted it and it happened. But it's not like the stars didn't shine. It, this is not literal language. It's just judgment language that he used whenever he was going to judge a place. Ezekiel chapter 32. Verse 1 says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him. And then you skip down to verse 7 and 8, and here's what he's saying. Egypt. Now, this is not the Egypt that Moses went to. This is Egypt around 300, 400 BC that Ezekiel saying is gonna happen. He says uh, in verse seven, when I put out your light, I will cover the heavens and make its stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give her light. And the bright lights of the heavens, I will make dark and over you and bring darkness upon your land, says the Lord God. So uh, this is just, his language. So Jesus is saying, um, this, when I come, the, the, the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of heaven will be shaken so that they know, uh oh, that's judgment. That's what he says whenever there's a place. And I guess judgment is coming. Jesus says, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Ooh, hope I have, I'm going to take, have my time to do this. Um, so, so I want to talk about the part of this where it says the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Again, we, talk, we discussed before that literally you weren't going to see Jesus sitting on a cloud and just kind of floating by. But that idea of clouds coming before a storm. Again, he is, he is quoting Old Testament scripture that the hearers would go, oh, ooh, coming on the clouds. I know what that is. I've heard that language before. Here's what some people think it is, and I just want to, I just don't agree, but I'll let you make up your mind. Uh, in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a vision of four beasts, and the fourth one has 10 horns, and the, this beast is the Roman Empire. The 10 horns, I believe, are 10 emperors who came from the period when Jesus was born until seven, 10 emperors during that time period. Bes Vespasian was one of them. Uh, Nero was one of them. Augustus, Claudius, uh, all these, Tiberius, these are all these, these, these emperors. Uh, so he has a vision of the Roman Empire. It's the, that's the fourth beast with ten horns. And then one of the horns, um, there's one that pops out, right? Not like a zit, but and three horns are replaced by this one. Uh, and this one horn begins to persecute the saints. So in Daniel's vision, and I, you'll see why I'm talking about it, because it, it, there's a vision of 
someone coming with the clouds, not on the clouds, but with the clouds. Uh, Daniel chapter seven, I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. So three of the first horns, that's significant, were, were displaced by this one horn. And there in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Now, obviously this is just symbolic of someone who's attacking with words and says, I watched, verse nine, I watched till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated and his garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. And his stone was a fiery flame and its wheels a burning fire. So that is the exact description that John gives Jesus in the book of Revelation in the first chapter. Describes him that same way. In verse 14, it says, His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flame. His feet were like, like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, said to me, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. That can only be Jesus, that's a description of Jesus. He was alive, he died, and now he's alive forevermore. That's not a description of God. God didn't die. If he did, we're in trouble. So, but Jesus, who went, you know, came in this earth suit, he did die and took our place and took our punishment for us. So, so this is an image for me, the Ancient of Days is being described the same way that Jesus is described. I believe that this is Jesus who sat down on the chair. But here's the confusing part. Uh, in verse 13, it says, I was watching in the night's visions, and behold, one, like the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven. Now, he's coming up to heaven. This is an ascension up to heaven. This is not coming down to the earth to bring judgment. This is someone coming up to the heavens. And I could understand why you think this is Jesus, because that's exactly what he did in the first chapter of Acts. He went up to heaven. But he's already sitting on the throne. And, and again, the Bible says no one has seen God at any time. No man has seen God at any time. So I, I just don't understand how Daniel could have had a vision of and described him, and his hair was white, when it says no one has seen God at any time. I think that was Jesus. Who's coming up? Who's coming up then? And I understand why people think that's Jesus coming up. I, I get it. Okay, coming with the clouds of heaven, coming up to heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given and I believe it's to the Ancient of Days. So I saw the Ancient of Days, I see him coming up and they bring him before him. And to him, I believe that him is referring to the Ancient of Days, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So we've got two choices. This is either God sitting in the throne and Jesus came up to him, or this is Jesus sitting in the throne and someone else has come up there. So I believe it's number two, number, uh, uh, number B. Number B. Okay, 20, verse 21 in then chapter seven says, I was watching, so he's beginning to get the explanation. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints. And remember, he had a vision of a, of, a, of a horn that was speaking pompous words and then thrones were set in place and the ancient of days sat down. So he says, I was watching, and that same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. I believe that that is the saints that Jesus sent out to preach the word, and they're being persecuted by the covenant breakers. The covenant keepers are being persecuted by the covenant breakers, right? And everywhere Paul went, Peter went, James, the, the Herodians are attacking them, the Jews in power, everybody's attacking them, right? So it says, I was watching, the same horn was making war against the saints, and prevailing against them until the ancient of days came. And a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints of the kingdom. So I believe, for me, that person coming up is, is an image of the saints who, is, who we're receiving the kingdom. God is giving us his kingdom. Because Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is already among you. I'm already here. 
I'm trying to invite you into the kingdom. I'm trying to give us the kingdom. And he says, Peter, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. Uh, verse 24, the 10 horns are 10 kings who shall arise from this kingdom. That's the Roman Empire. And another shall arise after them, and he shall be different from the first ones, the first three kings. He'll be different and shall subdue them, take their place. And the Herodians spoke for three Roman emperors. The Herodians, King, uh, King Herod and Herod Agrippa, and they spoke, and they, pers and they were the voice of Rome in the city for many years. And they're the ones who attacked uh, and killed James and persecuted Peter. And they were carrying out Rome's bidding. And I believe that that's what that little horn is. It says, and uh, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. And then the saints shall be given into his hands for a time and times and half a time, which is times. That's two of those years. And after Jesus died in Jerusalem and that's when everybody spread out boom they left so once they stoned Stephen and he looks up and he has this same vision and he sees at this point that's when I believe the books are opened and God says okay now I'm going to begin to to bring judgment on Jerusalem. I gave Jerusalem a chance. I sent Jesus and for three and a half years, I had them preaching and they killed Stephen, done. Okay, so he says, then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. I believe that's three and a half years, but the court shall be sealed, seated. I'm sorry, so now the court's gonna be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people and to the saints of the Most High. So I believe that is a type of the church going up to receive, and he's giving them the kingdom. That, that Jesus is the ancient of days sitting there and saying, I'm now I'm giving you authority. All authority is given to me in both in heaven and in earth, and now I'm passing it unto you to go out and spread the gospel, to lay hands on the sick, and to preach the word, and, and that we are now his kingdom, we're carrying his kingdom forward. And so the, and the gates of hell won't prevail against us if we're on the move. But if we're just sitting around doing nothing, then the gates of hell are like, whoo, I'm so glad they're not showing up here. So he's given us authority, and that's what the disciples did. They spread the word until finally Jesus is, okay, that's done. And all dominions shall serve and obey him. So just, I'm about to end. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 19, so when Jesus says you, you shall see him coming in the clouds, I believe he's quoting this particular scripture, not the one I just spent a lot of time on. He says, Isaiah 19, 1, the burden against Egypt. Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt will totter at his presence at the heart of Egypt and will melt in its midst. In its midst. And so when, when God, and that's just, I just picked Isaiah 19. But whenever he was about to come and bring judgment, he would say, I'm coming on a cloud and I'm going to bring judgment. And when Jesus says, and you'll see the son of man coming on a cloud, I believe that he's doing what he says in, in here in Mark chapter 14. He's sitting on his throne, but he's sending that cloud of judgment, right? Um, in Mark 14, it says, and again, the high priest asked Jesus. Jesus is standing up right for trial, saying to him, are you the Christ? the son of the blessed. And Jesus says, I am. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So you'll, you're going to, you are going to see this judgment. You're going to see him sitting at the right hand of power, but sending out that cloud of judgment, that rainstorm. It's going to rain children. And, and the old do that all the time. And that was a type of the judgment is coming, you know, so you better get inside that ark. And in fact, Jesus talks about that coming up about those who were smart enough to get inside the ark because that rain is coming and that when that, that the clouds is that type of that judgment that came even in noah's day so and it says and he will send his angels this is back to jesus with the sound the great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other so we'll explain that we'll dissect that next wednesday uh and i know there's a lot of information but this is all still about Jesus 
talking about judgment coming on Jerusalem. It's not the second coming. It's we want to talk about the second coming. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's all about that. But this is about the end of his first coming where he says, I, I'm going to bring salvation and judgment. And so he ends with judgment. But all those who listened, they escaped. And we want to make sure that we keep preaching, keep spreading the word because he's given the kingdom into our hands and it's up to us to spread it. All right. So thank you again for, for listening. and. I will be speaking again, Sunday school on Sunday, this Sunday, and I'll see others of you uh, next week. So thank you so much and God bless.